Well, good morning. Wow, what a day. <clears throat> hey, I am so excited about your response as a church to this Holy Spirit series. Um, last week, you know, I did that Facebook Live thing, and you guys were all over that. It was so awesome to hear your questions and to, to hear the hunger that, we, that you have to know about the Holy Spirit, to, to recognize His work. And I just I commend you. I applaud you. There are a few things that I would be more excited for you to be excited about than to know, to learn, to move in the power of the Holy Spirit. So this, God's doing something in our church, isn't he? Isn't it cool? Yeah, it's, it is really cool. So um, if, you were at, if you were on Facebook Live last week, you, you know that we were inundated with questions and we didn't even get to half of them, even though we went longer than we expected. Uh, if you missed that, some people, people have been asking me, just go to our, um, our open, Church's Open Doors Facebook page and scroll down and you can see uh, the, the Facebook Live event. You can check it out, see some of the questions. And um, uh, we, we promised you that we would try to answer all those questions. So I made a videotape this past week to try to get to all the rest of your questions and those that were sent in after and before. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to release that this week to uh, write that, I think, on Facebook. Is that right, Alex? Okay. Um, but I saved one of the most popular questions that was asked had something to do with how does the Holy Spirit lead us? And that question got asked again and again in all different kinds of ways. You know, how do I tell the difference between my feelings and the voice of the Holy Spirit? How do I tell the difference between my thoughts and the thoughts of God? Um, what does the guidance of the Holy Spirit look like? And so there were so many questions like that that I decided to just pull them all together and do that today. So I was planning on doing this message at the end of the series, but there's so much eagerness, which is so cool, to to um, know how to be led by the Spirit that I just wanted to talk about that today. So that's what we're going to talk about is how does the Holy Spirit lead us? And to do that, I want us to go right back into this passage we've been in for you know, all of January because um, I keep telling you there's so much truth just packed into this passage and especially this verse. So John chapter 14 um, Jesus, the night before he dies, he's getting ready to leave, and then he says to his disciples, I'm going to ask the Father, and he's going to give you another helper. We saw that another means just like me, and he's the capital H helper. He's the one that, that the Father's going to give to help you follow me, to help you in every way you, know, you need, and this, this helper is the Spirit of God, the Spirit of truth, the, the Holy Spirit. And throughout this series, we've been talking about how the Bible has um, decided, and I'm so glad it, it has, it's chosen to describe the invisible spirit, the invisible Holy Spirit. It's chosen to describe him with language like the breath of God. Remember, if you've been, we keep talking about this, that the, um, the spirit of God is the breath of God breathing his life into us. And um, in the beginning of creation, we see this picture of the breath. And then throughout the Old Testament, and then in the New Testament, we find that in both these testaments, old and new, it, there, it's the same word for breath as it is for spirit. Why did, the God, why did God do that? Why is the Bible that way? Because it's trying to teach us something about the spirit of God who's invisible, who's, who's the God's breath. Now, I've been hammering that the last couple of weeks teaching us how to breathe in the Spirit, but there's a, there's a drawback that i got to let you know about only seeing the Spirit of God as the breath of God, even though it's a very biblical concept and it has all kinds of fantastic implications, there's a drawback. And so today as we talk about how the Spirit of God, the breath of God leads us, I want to help explode what this drawback is that some of us might have so um, let's go back to this, this verse and see how the Holy Spirit, the Holy Breath of God, leads us, this, this, um, and I told you how in the NLT, the New Living Translation, there's this language of leadership. And um, so write down on your, your notes the, the kind of the direction we're going today is, is how does the Holy Spirit lead us? How does the breath of God 
breathe into us and give us the leadership we need. And it's not just in this verse here, but later on in the evening, just a couple chapters later, Jesus uses the, the, the same language to say when the Holy Spirit comes, when the, the breath of God is breathed into you and upon you, he will guide you. And this word in the Greek is, is, is the leadership word. It's, I, I'm not really sure why they didn't translate it. He will lead you. It's, it's a great way to translate. Guide is good too, but I want you to see that in this night, that several times we have this language of how the Holy Spirit will, will guide us and will lead us. Now, let me clean that page up and then point out with the highlight something I want to draw your attention to. Um, and notice how many times we have this language of relationship, that he will be with you, that this is not, the Spirit is not a what, the Spirit is a who, and he will come and lead you. The drawback of talking about the Spirit of God as the breath of God is that it can cause some, some people to think of the the spirit, the breath, as an impersonal um, force that, you know, when we don't think about breath as being personage. Um, we think of breath comes from a person, so, you know, we're thinking God's the person, but that his breath is this impersonal, this force that comes from God. So why does the Bible use the breath of God to describe the spirit of God? And isn't that... You know, kind of a Star Wars kind of thing. May the force be with you. May the, this impersonal breath. So what we want to do whenever we're studying the Bible is we want to try to, to grasp, get our arms around all the biblical data. In this case, all the things that the Bible says about the Holy Spirit and keep them together. And not focus on only one thing about the Spirit. He's the breath of God. Or another thing, but try to get our arms around what is a biblical concept? What does the Bible teach us about who the Holy Spirit is? And this, this next thing I'm about to say is, is just so huge that this relational um, he, not, it's not a gender issue when we say he. My point is not that the Holy Spirit's male. It's, the issue is not gender. The issue is that he's person. He has personage. And so he's not leading as a force, as an impersonal cloud, but he's leading as a person. So how does the Holy Spirit lead us? What I'm about to write, ask you to write down, some of you are going to be disappointed to, to write down because this is the most important thing for you to write down about the Holy Spirit and how he leads us. It's the primary way he leads us. And when I, when I have you write it down, you're going to go, that's not primary. Yes, it is. Just wait. You ready for the unveiling? Bam. The Holy Spirit leads us primarily through relationship. What do I mean by that? Well, when we talk about him as breath, you could get this idea that he's impersonal. And I keep hearing people talk about, I need to know what God wants me to do. I need to know how to be led. I need the voice of God to speak. I need direction. And they treat God and the Bible as if he's some kind of great answer man in the sky. He's some cosmic vending machine that if I put in church attendance and then put in, um, you know, some money, put in some prayers and pull the lever, out should come the will of God. Out should come direction for what I need. I want to know what God wants me to do. And so since I'm not living in relationship with him, I'll just use this great vending machine. What I want you to see is don't treat God like he's a crystal ball, like he's some kind of magic eight ball. Or the, don't treat the Bible like it's some kind of a magic book. Instead, pursue God in relationship, and that's the way he'll lead you. And if you're not walking in relationship with him, you will have a hard time hearing his leadership. God won't be used. You can't treat him like a, like a rabbit's foot. He won't be used for you just to say, I'll do whatever I want to do. I'll ignore God until I need some direction, and then suddenly I'll try to get chimey again, or chummy again with God. He, he wants to lead us, but he wants to lead us in relationship. Over and over and over again, this is the message of God. Walk with me. Trust me. Know me. I made you to be in relationship with me. 
Don't turn me into an idol. Don't turn me into a, a deistic, um, so transcendent God out there that, that I, we can't be in relationship. I am inviting you into relationship. And the byproduct of our intimate relationship is I'll lead you. You'll be led. You'll know which way to go because you're walking in relationship with me. See, what we try to do, this is like the, the human condition, is we try to turn um, Christianity or some kind of you know, divine message into some sort of religion. And we want this religion to be a list of rules and regulations, a list of rituals to go through. And if you do a sociological study on humanity, on, on, on people throughout history, you'll see that every people group is incurably religious. And they turned their hunger for God, they turned the fact that they've been made in the image of God to be in relationship with God into a religion. Write this down, because this isn't in your notes. Just look at your notes. There's not enough room for me to put this on there. But I want you to see it. Christianity is not a religion. It's not a religion, comma. It's not a list of rules and rituals. It's a relationship. That's so basic, it's so core that it affects everything like being led by God. It's this living, breathing, revitalizing relationship with the living God that's enlivened by the breath of God, the Holy Spirit. And this is what he's inviting us into. Those of you who were here a couple weeks ago, remember I posed the question, why is it that this night... John 13 through John 17, which records the night before Jesus died. Why is it on this night that Jesus chose to introduce what we call the Lord's Supper, communion, Eucharist? Um, we're going to celebrate that later today. Why is it that it's this night that he chose to introduce the Lord's Supper at the same night that he chose to introduce the Holy Spirit? Because this is, this is when we're introduced to the Spirit, the night before Jesus dies. Why, why these things together? And there's multiple reasons, but I think one of the reasons has to do with our propensity to turn um, the things that Jesus did, like communion, like the Lord's Supper, to turn that into a ritual that becomes a religion around which we build our relationship with God. And God never intended for us to turn communion, the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, into a ritual that defines our, our Christianity. And so I think he knows that we have this propensity. I mean, look at some of the churches around us. They're all built around that, that you know, Eucharistic moment. And so he, the same night that he gives us that ritual, that remembering, he introduces the Holy Spirit who is not some religious thing, but a living, breathing person who introduces us into a living, breathing relationship. And that becomes the, the substance of our, our faith, that that becomes our relationship, this living relationship with God through the Holy Spirit and not a ritual we go through. Now, I'm not dissing the ritual because Jesus said, as often as you do this, remember me. But he never intended for that to be the definition of our, our faith. Does this make sense? And so, so the, the, the message of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Spirit, that Jesus introducing the Spirit is so significant on this night that he wants us to see that this breath of God that breathes life into you, that breathes life into Adam, that breathes life into Jesus when he was in the tomb, this breath that, breathes, that makes you a Christian, this breath that guides you and leads you, is the, the very presence of God who is personal and relational. I want you to know him. One of the questions that I got a bunch of times was, can we pray to the Holy Spirit? Is that okay? Well, the answer is absolutely. Why? Because he's God. He's the third person of the Trinity. Prayer is that thing called talking to God. That's what prayer is. So if the Holy Spirit's God, and he is, then absolutely talk to him, pray to him, address him. So I want to invite you, if you were among the group of people that heard that the only way to pray is to the Father, in the name of the Son, through the Holy Spirit, I challenge you to find that in the Scriptures. You won't. You won't find that. 
Instead, what you'll find is this language again and again about the Holy Spirit being a person, the Holy Spirit being God, and so we pray to him. And he will speak back to us. Because he's person, because he's relational, he is a God who not only has spoken, but is speaking. Now, I should be making a couple people here really, really nervous. What do you mean God is speaking? No, no, what, what's true is that God has spoken in his word. You don't mean to say that God's still speaking, do you? Yes. Can I, can I be more clear? God is speaking. The Holy Spirit is speaking. You know, you see this throughout the scriptures, but let me just show you four scriptures from Acts. And the Holy Spirit said... And the Holy Spirit said, and the Holy Spirit says. So he is a speaking God. And there is nothing that I can find, even though I've read what other people think shows this. There's nothing in the Bible that indicates to me that the Holy Spirit has stopped speaking. Think about it. He's a person, and suddenly he goes mute. Now, understand that the way he speaks today is through his word, primarily, but it's through a relationship that we have through with him, not treating the Bible like a magic book or not treating the Bible like an an ancient deposit that just kind of happened in history. God spoke, and now he's done, and we just need to go to the Bible and try to find truth there. No, no, the Bible is living. It's active. The God who spoke this into existence, 2 Timothy 3.16, says the Bible is God breathed. It's breathed. It's breathed out by God. That God is still alive, and his word is alive. So God speaks, not in an ancient, dusty book, but he speaks to you, and in lively words, to you, and anything that he says has to line up with what he said once and for all for the saints, delivering the saints. So, so this is, these are some ways that we begin to understand, oh, because when we hear people say, God spoke to me, Some of us were like, oh, that makes me nervous. There's been some kooky, crazy, ridiculous things done in the name of God spoke to me, God said to me. I mean, cults get built around this idea that God said to me. Ah! So we should all be a little bit nervous when someone says God said to me, God told me, but let's not discount and let's not muzzle the Holy Spirit so he can't speak anymore. Let's know him. Let's not treat this book like an antiquated deposit. Let's know him and walk with him in relation, an intimate relationship with him so the God who still speaks can be heard by his people and we don't have to treat him like he's a superstitious kind of incantation. When somebody claims that they've been heard from God, We ought to be able to know God so well that we can go, yes, I confirm that's what God would say. Or, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound like God. How do you know that? Because you know God. You're in relationship with him. Is this making sense? You're walking with him. You have an alive, intimate relationship. Watch this. Hearing from God comes best out of loving intimacy with God. This is the heart of God, friends. When you feel like the heavens are brass, when you feel like your prayers are bouncing off in heaven, that you can't hear from God, it doesn't mean that God has stopped speaking. There's a number of reasons why you might be feeling like God's not speaking or you're not hearing from him, but it's not Because God has stopped speaking. He is speaking to those who will listen to him. He, you know, this is an old time um, um, illustration, but it still works, even though some of us have forgotten about how the radio works. You know, radios tune in to sound waves. The sound waves don't start when you turn your radio on. 
Sound waves don't start when you tune into them. They've been broadcasting. They've been out there, and they're actually moving right now through the atmosphere. You, nobody can grab them and see them, but they're there. And when you tune into them, then you can hear the frequency. You can hear what's being broadcast. That's the way the Holy Spirit is. He's speaking. It's just that we're so busy, we're tuned into other things. We're not listening, and we're, we're, we've drowned out the voice of God. Make sense? An old illustration, but it still works. And so we want to live in communion with him and begin to recognize his language, yes? Because he's a person, because he wants to be in relationship with us, and because he will speak primarily through our relationship, we want to recognize what is his language? What's the language of God? What's the language of the Holy Spirit? Now, when I say this, some people go, oh, and that's, that's, that must be this, the language of tongues. That the, this, the language of the Spirit is the language of tongues. Be careful. That's, that's actually not what the Scripture teaches. Um, the Holy Spirit has a native tongue, and his native tongue is not some mystical language that you don't know. What is the native tongue of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> The Word of God. This is his primary language. This is the native tongue of the Word of God. Again, he breathed these words out. And so as you're learning to recognize the, the voice of God so you can get his leadership, as you're re recognizing um, the language of God, it would behoove you, behoove, that's a really good word. It would behoove you to know the Word of God, his native tongue, his primary language. So, write this down. We learn the language of the Spirit of God in the Word of God. Now, I just mentioned tongues. Can, can the Holy Spirit speak through unknown tongues? Well, read your Bible. <laughs> yes, he can. He does. I mean, that's, that's one of the gifts of the Spirit. But that's not the definition of the language of God. Okay. That's one of the ways. Actually, the Holy Spirit can speak any language. He can speak your language. He, he will customize his message to you, his truth to you, in a language you can understand. But he will do it primarily through his word that he's breathed out, that he's still breathing life into. The, the word that he breathed out uh, when the Bible was written is now the word he will use to breathe in to you. This is his words. We want to traffic in the word of God. So now I'm ready to say what some of you wish I would have said first, that the Holy Spirit leads us through scripture. But here's what I want you to see. I think I've made this point. It's not that the Bible is a magic book. It's that God will speak through the Bible through your relationship with him. So you have got to get to know the Bible, right? Right? I mean, you can't treat it like a dusty book that you go to whenever you need direction. Use the Bible as uh, the way that you interact with God. Um, study the Word of God. And you say, well, <laughs> where do I start? It's a big book. I know. Here's where I suggest. Stutter, start and study the life of Jesus. That's the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, you, you hear about Jesus, and you hear about his life in Acts and some of the epistles, but primarily, the life of Jesus is displayed in the Gospels. Study them, read them, pray them, uh, go over them again and again. Why? <laughs> because in the life of Jesus, we see what it looks like to be led by God. Did you hear what I just said? In the life of Jesus... We see the model. We see the example. We see this is how it works, which is fascinating to me because if there's ever been a person who's lived in the history of the world who could have gone on their own, it was Jesus of Nazareth. I mean, he's God in the flesh. And yet, that Jesus of Nazareth deliberately and intentionally built his life around listening to the Father, being led by the Spirit. Let me, let me show you an example Go back one book to the Gospel of Luke. And, uh, oh, this is so good. Luke chapter 4. Um, Luke does the best job of helping us see how the Spirit works in the life of Jesus. Same guy that wrote Luke is the same guy that wrote the book of Acts. 
And so he goes out of his way to help us see even before Jesus is born, the Spirit's working. And, and, but what I want you to see here in Luke 4 is that Luke's done with the preliminaries, okay? He's ready to now launch into telling us the story of the teaching of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, the amazing story of this Jesus guy. And he starts the whole teaching life and ministry of Jesus in Luke chapter 4 with the verse Luke 1 Four one says, now Jesus, full of the Spirit, returned in the, from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit. The very first thing Luke wants us to see about Jesus and his life is that he's led by the Spirit. Doesn't that mean something to you? Later on, he says, and he lived in the power of the Spirit. Verse 18, and it says, Jesus went into the synagogue and opened up the scroll to Isaiah 61 and quoted it and said, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me. I mean, it's Spirit, 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 Spirit. Luke is packed with Spirit language because he wants us to see Jesus didn't live his life in his own strength. If anyone could, it would have been Jesus. And if he needed to be full of the Spirit, then, hello, how about you and me? We don't have a chance if we're not living full of the Spirit. Now watch this. We went right to led by the Spirit, but the trick, I don't like that word, the secret to being led by the Spirit is to live full of the Spirit. Jesus teaches this. Write this down. Living full of the Spirit is essential, critical, absolutely necessary if you want to be led by the Spirit. We're back to this relationship. Jesus, full of the Spirit, is living in this full relationship with God, full relationship with the, with the Father and the Spirit. And as he's living full, it's very easy for him to be led. Does this, this make sense? He doesn't try to be led Outside of relationship, sometimes we can read the Old Testament in such a way that it looks like people only wanted to talk to God when they needed direction. So you have this, these kind of strange, almost incantational type of interactions between God and the people because they, did, they weren't living an intimate relationship. And this is the beauty of Jesus saying the night before he died, guys, I'm leaving and everything's about to change the Holy Spirit's not going to come and go. He's not going to be someone like you visit, like in a nursing home. You know, sometimes people treat church like that. Well, let's go see God at the Church of the Open Door on the weekend, you know, and check in with him, see how he's doing. Now, we don't treat him like a magic book, and we don't treat him like a, somebody in a nursing home. We live in intimate relationship with him. And Jesus says, it's good for me to go away because now you can live an intimate, day by day, moment by moment, breath relationship with God. And so he will lead you and guide you every moment of the day as you live in relationship with him. So don't think Old Testament, I need to go to Shiloh. I need to go to Hebron. I need to go to Jerusalem. I need to go someplace, some place to find God, to hear from God. Now, Paul says, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, he's with you, but the Spirit will be in you. And when you're living in relationship with him, now you have the leadership you've been looking for all along. But don't try to find the leadership of God if you're not living in relationship with him. So you say, well, what do I do when I'm not walking with God, when I'm not living in relationship? I guess I can't hear from God. No, get in relationship. Get back in relationship. You know, God's not going to play cat and mouse with you. That's not his way. He, he doesn't play tricks on us. He invites us into relationship. And when we realize that we're not walking with him, that we're treating him like someone in a nursing home or treating him like a, a magic a book. He exposes that and says, come on back into relationship. And friends, we, let me put it close to my mic. We can come back to him like that. We don't have to go to church, although I invite you to. We don't have to go through some kind of a ritual. Just return now. Get back into relationship because it's in relationship that you hear him. And if we will live in relationship with God through the word of God, we will hear the leading of God. You'd be surprised how many times people come to me saying, I, don't, I can't hear from God. I need to hear from him. I need to hear from him. I, I don't know which way to go. I, I need to make a decision. They want me, the pastor, to 
like to act like a priest and go talk to God for them. Well, here, bring your sacrifice and I'll do it. Then I'll listen to God. No, you, you can talk to God. And they're like, well, you know, I can't hear from him. You're not living in relationship with him. You, you're not going to be able to hear. So, so surrender your life. Get back in relationship with him. And then I would say to you, when we watch the life of Jesus, we learn that he not only lived full of the Spirit and led by the Spirit, but it's, it's fascinating how many times Jesus opens his mouth to speak and what comes out is Scripture. Do a study. Actually, I, I did that in my, in my book, if you want to read that. How Jesus, Scripture, 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 Scripture. He's quoting it constantly. In fact, right here in Luke, he's being led by the Spirit. He goes into the wilderness, gets tempted. And what does Jesus do? Every time the spirit of the evil spirit, um, Satan tempts him. What does he do? Every time. It is written. Ha, what? The Son of God who spoke worlds into existence? He could send Satan sprawling with a word. Instead, he quotes, it is written. Listen to the message of Jesus. Model your life after Jesus. He was a man who was saturated with the word of God. It came out of him because he was constantly thinking about it, meditating on it. Watch this. If you want to hear from God, if you want to be led by the Spirit, then structure your life around Scripture. Build your life around the Word of God. Now, I know. I hear what you're thinking. Dude, you don't know how busy my day is. I am inundated with things happening. I don't have time to go read the Bible. Yes, you do. Don't buy the line or take the cop out that I'm too busy to read, to meditate on the Word of God. Yes, you can. Listen to me. Yes, you can. You will make time for what is most important to you. Um, so how do you do that? Well, people are like, well, Jim, duh. You I mean, you're a pastor. You don't have to, what can you teach us about that? You know, you, you probably sit around all day reading the Bible and praying. Your arms crossed. Going, Ooh. No, I don't. No, you, you ask our staff, you know, I'm, I'm leading meetings, I'm teaching, I'm equipping, I'm preparing, I'm, I'm uh, making decisions, I'm gathering people together. I, I'm busy with a lot of leadership things. Oh, yeah, by the way, i got to write a sermon every week. So I have a very packed life, and yet I have built my life around the Word of God. But better than that is the, the, the number of people who I've known over the years in every church I've pastored who were not pastors, who were not ministry directors, who were men and women who worked in the workforce uh, outside of the church and yet who built their life around the Word of God, who structured their life around the Word of God daily. They, they model how to do this. So friends, here's a couple examples. Uh, today with all the technology, you know, put it, have a scripture come up at every, uh, every three hours on your phone. Just pops up. Put it on the wallpaper of your phone. So when you open your computer, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a verse, the meditation verse for the day. Maybe the memory verse for last week. And so, and so you are using technology to prompt you to keep the word coming back to you. Um, when you're driving in the car, instead of listening to the radio, why not listen to scripture? novel thought. Um, when you're, when you're um, uh, in the brushing your teeth or shaving in front of the mirror, um, I do it in the shower, so this doesn't work for me, but, you know, put the scripture on a, on a note card on the mirror. The, find ways. Come on, I'm challenging you. Find ways throughout the course of your day to pick a verse and to meditate on that verse all day long. Don't try to meditate on a whole chapter Unless you want to do Psalm 117, that's, that's a good one because it's only a couple of verses. But, um, but find a verse that's in our church devotions and just think about that. Meditate on that, that, the memory verse for the week. And build your life around Scripture. How about this? How about before you go to bed at night, um, instead of sitting in your bed with your computer and having that blue light keep you, uh, you know, j uh, stimulate your brain so when you do try to go to sleep, it will keep you awake, why not close the computer, turn off the phone, and get an old-fashioned book out? <laughs> they still make these things. And, um, and read the Bible before you go to bed. Why would I do that? Here's why. Because 
The last thing you think about before you go to sleep, by the way, your brain isn't going to sleep. It's like your brain kicks into gear when your body goes to sleep. The last thing that you, that you are thinking about is the Word of God. So all night long, it's working on that. It's, it's cogitating. It's rolling that. It's, it's marinating. Ooh, I love that word. It's marinating in your brain instead of the values, the crap that is on most television or most internet or most Netflix, most movies, the values that are there instead of them or the tea or the news, that's playing in your brain as you're trying to sleep. Structure your life around the Word of God so the Word of God is shaping you. Because whatever you think about before you go to bed is shaping you all night long. You choose. What do you want to shape your mind? Your mind is being shaped. Why not you intentionally choose to use the Word of God to shape your mind? And it, it, you can do it while you're sleeping. It doesn't even take any time and attention. Sweet. You know, sleep for 10 hours if you can. You know, whatever it takes, but all night long, that word is, is shaping your thinking and it's shaping your values. You're building your life around the Word of God. Why not start your day with reading the Bible, studying the Bible, meditating on the Bible? Why not every week come and hear the preaching of the Word of God? It's become popular in our culture today to say, well, I only go to church. You know, I, that's my church. I, I'm a regular attender. That means you go once a month. Can I challenge you to come to worship, to church every week? You're like, what? I know, crazy idea, countercultural. Let me just challenge you. Come every week and hear the preaching of the Word of God. So there's a daily time, there's a weekly time. And so you're reading, you're studying, you're meditating, you're memorizing, and you're letting that shape. Let me, let me, let me just give you an example of how this works. Our last, last week's... Um, Memory verse was John 1.14, right? Where John writes, for the word became flesh. That word is Jesus. So Jesus became flesh. He became human. It's Christmas. That's the Christmas story. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, full of grace and truth. Now, friends, there's a, there's a ton of of wonderful truth there. So you meditate on that and you pray that and you let that word dwell in you richly, as Paul says in Colossians. And just you think about that, you just dwell on it and wrestle with it in your brain. Let it marinate your brain. And then you, you come and you pray about it and you talk about it with other people, you share it. It's amazing how many things you will f find reinforced in your mind as you share with other people. Share what you learned in devotions that day. Share what you learned in Sunday and preaching. Talk to your life group about it. Talk to people throughout the week. And as you share it, it becomes reinforced in your mind. And uh, as you're doing this, the, the Word of God is shaping you. You're, you're, you're building your life around it. Now, I mentioned this idea of praying. If you get our church-wide devotions, and I encourage you to do this, every day we give you a structure. You re there's something to read, a, a chapter from the New Testament and a, and a part of a psalm in the Old Testament. Study that. Meditate on it. Memorize. We give you a verse to memorize every week. The one I just told you was our verse from last week. And then pray that verse. How do I get the devotions? Just go online and sign up. Or just call the church office. Or, you know, go through our church app. There's a million different ways. Well, there's five. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of different ways to, to get the devotions so that you can read, pray, study, memorize the Word of God. But when you pray the Word, something powerful happens in your life, friends. Um, let me show you how this works. I just quoted John 1, 14, so let me pray it for you. So, um, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We've seen um, His glory, the glory of the one and only from, full from the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, so I pray it by saying, Lord, I thank you that you came from heaven and lived among us. You came in the flesh. Thank you for not staying up there in heaven and coming down. Thank you for Christmas. And thank you for becoming flesh. And I know you experience everything I do. I'm so grateful for that. And thank you for showing us the Father. It's really, the, all the glory of God is displayed in your life. That's so beautiful. It's so awesome. I'm praying. I'm talking to God. Thank you, Jesus, for coming. Thank you, Father, for sending Jesus to show us what you're like. And I want to know more of that glory. And I want to be more like Jesus. How do I do that? Oh, because he lived full of grace and truth. That's what I want in my life. Fill me with grace and truth. I want to be more like Jesus. 
Would you this morning, Lord, just fill me with your presence. Breathe into me this grace and truth. Now that's a way of praying John 1.14. I just used the words and the phrases there and I turned them into a prayer. Does that make sense? You can do that with just about any verse. Now there's some verses that you probably shouldn't pray. And Judas went out and hung himself. Don't, don't pray that one, okay? So, you know, but, but there's all this stuff that you can, the scripture you can pray into your life. And that's, that's the third thing. The Spirit leads us through relationship, through scripture, and through prayer. Again, not prayer like an incantation. You don't say your prayers. You pray. And prayer is relationship. Prayer is listening every bit as much as it is Speaking, so develop some space in your life. Maybe it's the morning. Maybe it's during a break at, at work. Maybe it's at night where you're turning everything off and you're listening. Um, it's a greater challenge today than ever before to listen to God. There's so much good information. There's so much things I want to hear and see. Turn it all off. Turn it all off and be still and know that I am God, God says. Listen. Cultivate the discipline of listening. And it will start with finding a space and then develop those skills. The first time you try to do this, your mind is going to go, ah, I need some stimulation. I need some radio. I need some background noise. I I need something like like a pad behind me to, to hear. No, no. Get quiet. Learn to listen for God. He's speaking. You want to learn to hear what he has to say. Amen? It's not going to happen if you don't make the time. So, huh, so okay, so Jim, I'm being quiet. I'm being, I'm being, you know, I created a listening space. But when I do that, man, there's a thousand thoughts that come into my brain. Um, so this is what I do. When a to-do list falls into my brain, I keep a, a piece of paper next to the, my, where I'm praying, and I write it down so I don't have to think about it anymore. It's written down. I won't forget it. There. I can forget it now. And I'm listening. So when, when you listen to God, do you hear all kinds of different voices? Don't look at me strange like that. Do you see birds? And, no, I'm just kidding. Sometimes don't you wrestle with, is it, is it my voice or is this the voice of, you know, um, somebody else, or is it the voice of God? That's, I wrestle with that too. So here's what I've developed listening to others in, in my own life. I've developed a series of tests, and I can rip through these because they are also real obvious. When I think I'm hearing from God, when I've gotten quiet, when I'm reading the Bible, when I'm meditating, and I think I hear God saying this, how do I know if that's God? Here's some tests. First of all, the test of Scripture. I've already preached on this. Don't skip this. Is what I think I'm hearing from God consistent with the Spirit and the teaching of Scripture? Does it contradict what I, does it contradict Scripture? Because if it contradicts Scripture, you're not hearing from God. If what you think you're hearing contradicts Scripture, then you're probably not hearing from God. So there's a test you're going to have to know the Bible to know if it contradicts. So you've got to structure your life around the Scripture. This is a process. But this is the first test. Don't skip it. Second test. The test of character. What I mean by this is, is what you think you are hearing from God, is it consistent with the character of God as revealed in the Word of God? Not one verse lifted out. Not a couple verses, but as you take the Bible as a whole and God reveals himself in his word, right? I mean, this is what the Bible is all about. It's revealing who God is. So as God has revealed himself in the word, is what the thing you think you're hearing is consistent with the character of God as revealed in the word of God. You're going to go half back to a relationship now. You're going to have to go back to the word, but this is how you test whether or not you're hearing the voice of God, okay? I had a person ask me this past week, um, I'm wrestling with hearing the voice of God. This is what I'm kind of getting in my spirit. Is this God? And they say, he's saying to me, you you have to move back to this area. You better move back. There's a sense of coercion. He's he's pressuring me. And I said, stop right there. They're like, what do you mean? I said, I've heard enough. They're like, well, how do you know? What do you mean? I said, "Did, did you, is that how you meant to describe the voice that it's coercive, that it's pushing, it's demanding? He said, she said, yes. 
I said, that's not God. <laughs> well, how do you know? Because I know God. God doesn't coerce you. God doesn't demand from you. God doesn't do this piteous pleading to get you to do his will. He's not manipulating and, and demanding and pushing and, and guilting you into doing something. That's not God. If that's what you're hearing, you're hearing some, your own subconscious. You're hearing the voice of your mother. You're hearing the voice of your father. You're hearing you know, other voices, but you're not hearing the voice of God. Here's what the voice of God sounds like. It's a quiet voice. It's a self-authenticating voice. God doesn't have to prove himself. He speaks with a quiet, steady, clear voice. And he doesn't play tricks with us. Don't superimpose your own issues on God. He speaks quietly. And he speaks steadily. And he doesn't play games with you. God does not play games with you. And so that sense of... Um, the character of God. When you know God, there's a lot of times you can go, that's not God, that's not God, that's not God, simply because you can sense the content, the, you can sense the, the nature of that voice. Is, is this making sense? He doesn't do that demanding, coercive thing. That's not the way he speaks. Is it consistent with the character of God? Next test, test of wisdom. This thing that I think I'm hearing from God, is it, is it sound wise? <laughs> You know, I don't mean common sense. I mean, is it wise? If it's not, then you should stop and go, well, Lord, is that you? Um, I'm still listening. I wanna, I'm trying to confirm, is this you? Which brings me to the next two. The test of clarity. I get a confirmation in my spirit. I, I hear the, the voice of God with this clarity. Um, is it clear? Again, God doesn't play tricks with you. He doesn't go, um, he doesn't kind of mask what he's saying in code language and speak so imperceptibly you can't hear and then go, see if you can figure that out. It's not what God does. you got to get quiet, but he'll speak clearly and you'll know that you'll know that you know that's the voice of God. And it's clear and he'll say it again. He doesn't say, well, I told you once, I'm not going to tell you again. No. It won't be this persistent, you know, voice, 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 but you'll hear it when you get quiet again. This is the way. Walk in it. Give that away. Don't do that. Say this, go here, love that person, call that person. You'll sense this, this clear, quiet voice that's not demanding and also not a broken record, but you'll hear it again, and you'll hear it again. So this idea of clarity, how clear and consistent. God doesn't do Morse code. He doesn't play tricks with us. See if you can figure this out. No, he, he wants to lead you. He wants to be in relationship with you, you but you've got to do your part. You've got to listen. Okay, so I said confirmation. Test of confirmation. Do other people that are wise, do other godly people, um, can, can they confirm this? Can they go, well, that sounds like God. You know, when that person called me and said, does this sound like God? I was able to say, no, nope, that does not sound like God. I had a person ask me today, does this sound like God? I, I said, it sure does. Well, I've got some other people in my life that are saying it's not. I said, okay, weigh this. I gave them reasons for why I thought this sounded like God, consistent with Scripture. And they were going, oh, you're the first person that's confirmed this for me. Maybe it is of God. Now, you know, this is not, you don't want to take this one only. Don't take any of these all by themselves. They go together. But they also, you don't have to have all of these. Don't go, well, I've got five out of six. It must not be of God. No, no, don't. No, I'm not saying that. But here's, you're struggling with hearing God. Here's some tests to take. What's the test of experience? It's saying, as I've sought God in the past and he's led me, is this consistent with how he's leading me now? See, what happens is you build up a bank account, you build up a reservoir of hearing from God, and you, go, and you begin to recognize him. You go, oh, that sounds like God. That's how he spoke to me last time. Oh, that feels consistent. And when he speaks like this, watch this. Obey him. Don't. Ask God for his leadership, and then you decide, well, I don't know if I want to do that. God won't keep speaking to you if you decide, I'll do my own thing. He's not going to keep speaking if you keep disobeying. If you want to hear from God, when, 
when you've gone through the tests and when you think you've got clarity, then step out in obedience. And even if you don't have crystal clear clarity, if, if you think this is what God's doing, then step out and obey him. And, and, and listen, God's not going to punish you because you tried to hear from him. You listened. You were walking in relationship. You did the test, but you still made a mistake. He's not going to go, bam, you fool. He's going to go, no, you missed that, but that's all right. I love that you're listening. I love that you want to walk with me. Keep listening. We'll get this right. You'll hear my voice. You'll recognize. See, it's obedience. It's obedience that helps us recognize, oh, that was God. And if you disobey or decide, I don't want to do what God says, then you cut off yourself from your ability to hear from God. Watch this, write down. Obeying God's voice helps us hear God's voice. And that comes through our experience. The more you listen, the more you take the test, the more you're in the word, the more you obey, the better you hear. You know, somebody said to me last week, you know, I can't believe that on Facebook Live you were able to answer all those questions you know, without um, preparation and without, you know, you know, having the Bible open to get, you know, hold on, let me look in the Bible. No, friends, I didn't do that without preparation. I was very prepared. It was a lifetime of preparation, Right? I didn't study real hard before Facebook Live. I've been walking with God for decades. I've been reading. I've been memorizing. I've been meditating. I've been listening. I've been obeying God. And it's a lifetime of walking with God that gives you the experience to go, oh, that's God. Now, just be careful. I still struggle with, did I hear you, God? I don't want you to think that somehow I've got some hotline to heaven Remember when I told you about the whole Lorraine campus? I'm like, God, it sounds like you were saying this, and we did it, and now it's not working. What happened? I think God's like, I'm just teaching you. Trust me. I'm still speaking. Okay, I'm waiting. Sometimes I say, I'm waiting. Sometimes I say, I'm waiting. I'm trusting. But I just want you to know, I, I've said some things today. I don't want you to get the wrong impression that somehow whenever I say, God, speak, he speaks. Oh, you're so easy. No, I, I still struggle with this. I see through a glass darkly. But I'm trying to model for you a relationship, a lifestyle of living and listening to God. Is this making sense? Because I want you to hear from God. It's your birthright. It's your birthright. And the Spirit's speaking. I want you to, I want you to hear him. So here's, our, here's our te- our, our, the way the Spirit leads. Through Scripture and prayer done through relationship. Through relationship that's formed by Scripture and prayer. Well, you say, well... How, how do I build that relationship? Write it down. We develop our relationship with God through Scripture, prayer, and obedience. Obedience. So it, comes, it brings me back to the, what I said in the, near the beginning, that I don't want us to turn hearing from God, being led by God, into some kind of ritual or religion. I come back to this sentence. It's a living, breathing revitalizing relationship with the Holy Spirit. And I, w- I want for this for all of you. And so let me, let me finish by doing this. Go back to this verse that I, I love so much that we, we talked about last week where Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Let me do that right now to say to you and through our campuses and everywhere, uh, friends, Receive the Holy Spirit of God. The Spirit, breathe on us right now. In fact, Jesus, do like you did in John 20. Jesus, let's all say this together. Jesus, come and breathe on me. Let's say it together. Jesus, come and breathe on me. Not just so I can get direction, but so I can have life. So I can walk with you. And Spirit, come and breathe in me. Amen. And then you, you breathe out whatever sin he might point out in your life, fear, apathy, all that kind of stuff. Breathe it out. Breathe in his grace and his forgiveness. And just, just keep walking. Let's, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I'm just kind of I'm moving right from this sermon right into prayer. Bam, because this, this feels like a prayer to me. This whole sermon feels like a, 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 an insider's relationship with you, a fireside chat where we're hearing how you move. And here I am. You've, you've called me to be the pastor of this church, and I love these people, and I want so badly for them to, to know you, to walk with you, to be led by you, but not near as badly as you do. <laughs> not nearly as badly as you do. You, you're the God who speaks. 
So speak into our hearts right, right now. Witnessing in our spirit that what we've heard today is true. And take us all the way back to that, that night before you died with the disciples around that table. And you spoke words that they did not fully grasp, but words we remember today. The words of this body, this bread is my body, this cup is my blood. Remember me. Remember my words. Remember what I did. Remember my life. Remember what I've introduced to you tonight, the Holy Spirit, the breath of God. And so, Jesus, we ask you to bring us back to that table. And we say, Jesus, come and breathe on us. Breathe your life. We say, Spirit, come and breathe in us. Even as we come to this table together. For we pray in Jesus' name.